Towards the end of 2019, the world watched as a new virus was discovered in Wuhan, China, and in early 2020, it was looking like this Chinese coronavirus could cause major problems worldwide. Then, in March 2020, the governments of the world locked down the people restricting them to their homes. You must stay at home. This, of course, saw all major events cancelled, one of which was Cambon's Dravithic Day, an annual celebration of the life and works of the famous Cornish inventor, Richard Dravithic. As would have it, due to the restrictions, not one but two Dravithic days had to be cancelled. This was somewhat of a blow, as the 2021 event was going to be the 250th anniversary of Richard's birth and the organisers had big plans. Well, we couldn't let the coronavirus destroy all of the fun. So the organisers have been busy arranging a few things to keep the memory of Dravithic alive, including a window competition where the local shops display something related to Dravithic, and a £100 prize is awarded to the person that gets the most. There are a lot to find, but here are just a few. An animation of Richard Trevithick's life has also been specially commissioned and is set to be released on social media for everyone to share. And finally this video, which is being published on the Saturday, which was due to be the day of the celebrations. This video features people from Cornwall who are connected to the event or have something they wish to say. We hope you enjoy these messages and look forward to the 2022 annual Trevithick Day which is sure to be the biggest and best in history. Our first message is from Trevor Daly, the person who came up with the idea of Dravithic Day. Hi everybody. In January 1983, a meeting of the Camborne Traders Association turned into a free-for-all of dissent and despair. Companies were being asset-stripped by greedy entrepreneurs and depriving Cornwall of its traditional industries. Redundancies were rife, starving the retail trade of much-needed income, as important was the dent in Cornish pride of downsizing and closure of likes of Holmans and South Crofty. Many unkind remarks were made that evening, particularly about the state of Camborne, how it was a dining town. I went home very angry. I had difficulty getting to sleep that night, mulling over all that had been said and thinking that what was needed was a special occasion to bring the community together to take pride in our town. I nodded off only to suddenly awake at 2am. There, like a bolt out of the blue, was the answer. Camborne Trevithick Day. Even images were provided. Steam engines leading dancers up Trelawarn Street opposite my grandfather's shop of the 1930s. Climax Choir singing on the steps of Trelawarn Street Chapel, now Costa. Those images remain with me to this very day. It's a centuries-old tradition that we Cornish dance through our towns or villages on fair days and high days, and I was determined that at least two processional dances would provide a frame from which the festival would hang. There just had to be a dance. Firstly, the music. Musician Geoffrey Self married the tunes going up Cameron Hill coming down and Camborne Worthies in the tempo suitable to dance to. <coughs> Camborne Worthies was first noted in 1821 when Trevelyck was alive. We, <coughs> we gathered ten cohorts of Cornish dance enthusiasts at the Pool Leisure Centre where they competed for the best processional dance. The competition was won by Camborne Rotary, Camborne's dance to Camborne tune. The choreography of the dance describes that initial journey. 
That first Druidic day on Saturday the 28th of April 1984 turned out to be a beautiful day. People were turning up to shop then realised that Druidic day was a reality and rushed home to change. Most of the town's primary schools had groups of pupils that danced in the morning's Bell Maidens of Miners dance, while in the afternoon two committee's members took part in the Trevithic's dance in the company of invited folk, members of Rotaract and Ross Celtic. The entourage was led by David Solomon with his traction engine Phoenix. The other three of us walked between the engine and Camborne Town Bound in the company of, few, of a few local politicians who had helped us. We were applauded and cheered all through the town. I felt ten feet tall, a day I shall never forget. These days, Trevithic Day attracts huge numbers from far and wide. I believe there will always be a Trevithic Day, and in 50 years' time, I have every confidence that Camborne will celebrate Richard Trevithic's 300th anniversary, hopefully without the restraints of a pandemic. Elizabeth Kahn, who is the Grand Bard of Cornwall, also came to see us in Campbell and has this message. Dis dath we all, per loan of Avalbathmer Gorseth Kerno, Bozoma in Cambron, heth you, rag solemnia dith trevithic. Hello everyone, as Grand Bard of Gorseth Kerno, I'm very pleased to be here in Camborne today to celebrate Trevithic Day. I know that each year since 1984, there has been a wonderful day of celebration here to remember that great Cornishman, Richard Trevithick. I am delighted to be able to take part in this year's virtual Trevithick Day and would like to share a few words about the importance of such events throughout Cornwall. In Cornwall, we have a wonderful tradition of music, singing and dance. Many towns and villages have their own special processional dance which is learned by local children and danced each year at feast days and fair days. As adults, people remember with fondness the times they danced around the village or the town in celebration. It is an important date in their calendar, celebrated with great enthusiasm. Music, played on instruments such as fiddles, pipes and accordions, plays a big part in the music tradition of Cornwall. These instruments are often learned by children from their parents and grandparents. The tunes played have been passed down through the generations and form an important accompaniment to the dancing or singing. Cornwall has a rich history of male voice choirs, often formed years ago by workers in local industries, mining, clayworks or engineering. Their repertoire these days includes modern compositions some of which are now very much part of Cornwall, but also the traditional Cornish songs which have been sung for generations. The choirs contribute greatly to the celebrations, giving concerts outdoors in local squares, greens and preaching pits, or inside chapels, churches and halls. Not only male voice choirs these days, but many mixed and ladies choirs contribute greatly to Cornwall's music heritage, sharing the traditional songs for all to hear. Brass bands too, like the choirs, are a great Cornish institution. At one time, every town or village had its own band. They played for the processional dances, as well as giving outdoor concerts at the feast days. Tastes in music have changed over the years, and the number of bands and choirs has reduced, but the tradition continues at events such as this. It is so important to keep these traditions alive. These dances, songs and music are a rich part of our Cornish heritage and as such, a part of what makes Cornwall so special. Trevithic Day is a fitting celebration of a great Cornishman and an event that brings the whole community together. It is special to Camborne but it also plays a vital role in preserving the music and dance of Cornwall for generations to come. We met Phil Hoskin, a local author, as he delivered his latest book on Trevithick to the Camborne Town Library. Why was Richard's high-pressure steam engine such an important step? in the Industrial Revolution? 
Well, first of all, it was very much cheaper than any of the engines that Watt had built beforehand. Uh, Trevidic's intention was to replace the horse as a form of transport. And for this reason, you will find that all his, mo all his uh, models and demonstration vehicles all had wheels on them. Now, when the industrialists saw them, they had no time for that at all, but they thought that these little engines which weighed about four tons as opposed to the Watt engines which could weigh several hundred tons were going to be very useful to them and they were a lot cheaper and they would do a lot of work. So the, from 1800 when the Watt uh, patent ran out there was no demand for the Watt engine and it was all for the high pressure engines that Trevithick had initiated. They were copied by a lot of people, but it was certainly high pressure from that moment onwards, and there's thousands, millions of them have been built since then. Well, Watt retired immediately. His um, patent ran out in 1800. He was here. He'd lived in Cornwall for the previous 23 years, and he left here, and he retired. He left Bolton, and uh, he retired into a place where he said, that it should never be approached by a high-pressure steam engine. Watt's engine didn't have, didn't use steam at all. The word steam has been applied to it later. Watt, Watt never claimed to have built the steam engine. What Watt claimed was that he had improved the atmospheric engine of Mr. Newcomer. And uh, from there onwards, he would not have anything at all to do with high-pressure steam, which he called strong steam because he knew that misused it would blow up the boilers and people and some of Watt's um, men were killed as a result so he would have nothing at all to do with it. What Trevithick did was to invent a boiler which would hold high pressure steam that was a cylindrical boiler. Now the cylindrical boiler has come down to us as everything that holds steam as holds pressure to this day in the form of a fire extinguisher a submarine or an airliner or a beer can all of these things we see as cylindrical and it was Trevithick who invented the cylindrical pressure vessel it would be nice to clear up the fact that everybody thinks that Richard um, died a pauper in Dartford is that actually the case he was being paid very well by halls. Uh, he had a gold watch and he had a number of other things. He was staying in the finest hotel in town, uh, one which was um, where Queen Victoria stayed shortly afterwards. And uh, I don't suppose he had any spare money in his pocket, but uh, he had access to plenty of money and there was plenty of people who would be willing to pay him money for any of the inventions that he would perform for them. We met Samantha Hughes, who is the town clerk for Camborne Town Council, in Commercial Square for this message. Terrific Day is a day for which I have many fond memories, including dancing in the praise as a child in Camborne, my hometown. Trevithick Day is a lovely community event that is accessible to all with some great free entertainment that really brings the town to life. The day brings huge numbers of people into the town and informs a new generation of the proud history of the town and the importance of Richard Trevithick's invention. I hope that next year I and everybody else will get to enjoy this day once more once it is safe to do so. Camborne Town Council helped financially support Trevithick Day through the Community Grant Scheme and the Trevithick Day Committee do a wonderful job of organising the celebration of Trevithick's work and providing a joyful day for all to enjoy. And now a message from the Right Honourable George Eustace, MP for Camborne, Redruth and Hale and the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. 
This year is the 250th anniversary of the birth of Richard Trevithick, one of our country's finest uh, inventors, certainly the most famous inventor we have uh, in Cornwall. And of course, he came from the Camborne area and we're all incredibly proud of what he achieved. This year, sadly, the annual Trevithick Day celebrations will be slightly more muted than normal um, because of the coronavirus pandemic. We're all going to miss that opportunity to see the Puffing Devil replica uh, in action. Extraordinary device. I can remember when I first saw it just being astounded at the sheer speed uh, that this contraption uh, went at. And it's a reminder uh, of this really big, groundbreaking invention uh, right here in uh, Camborne from Richard uh, Trevithick. Now, of course, uh, like all inventors, uh, Richard Trevithick had uh, quite a mixed life. He uh, was famous for these inventions, but sadly, like so many inventors, uh, never really was able to fully capitalise on the commercial benefit of it and at stages went through some very difficult financial problems um, and uh, at times had to travel the world and work in South America far away from home in order to make a living. It's important in this uh, year that we remember everything that he did and when I was first elected uh, I um, dedicated a, a section of my speech to Richard Trevithick because I uh, came across an extract of a letter that he uh, had written to a friend uh, later in his life um, and I'm going to read it out now because I think it really says everything we need to know about the man. Uh, I have been branded with folly and madness for attempting what the world calls impossibilities. And even from the great engineer, the late Mr. James Watt, who said to an eminent scientific character still living that I deserved hanging for bringing into use the high pressure steam engine. This so far has been my reward from the public. But should this be all, I shall be satisfied by the great secret pleasure and laudable pride that I feel in my own breast from having been the instrument of bringing forward and maturing new principles and new arrangements that are of boundless value to my country. However much I may be straitened in pecuniary circumstances, the great honour of being a useful subject can never be taken from me, which to me far exceeds riches. Alan Buckley is a local author and historian who lived just around the corner from where Trevithick was born. Yeah, Richard Trevithick's uh, family were all Camborn family, uh, all of the branches, the mother's family and the father's right the way back to the 16th century. And, um, and all the branches of the family also were Camborn people right the way back. And there are extensive records right back to that time of the families, his ancestors. Um, his... Uh, they actually moved to Poole, where the um, house is now, which is in a place called Pedanic Veen, um, in the 1750s, where um, Richard's grandfather, John, built the house that, that uh, um, still exists, number 35, Home Farm, uh, Station Road, Poole. So um, uh, in those days, it wasn't always called Poole. Um, it was Poole Mine, and the village got the name really from the mine, Poole Mine. Um, but although it wasn't, some books say Tregajar and Wallace, but it wasn't really there. It was actually on this side of the, of the, of the stream, which is, which, which is a Penhelic. Um, the family then sort of uh, was successful. Um, both his, 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 his older, the, the, brother of his, uh, the older brother is of his father, John Trevithick, he became a senior mine captain at Dolcoth Mine, the biggest mine in the area. And then his father became also a senior mine captain there. He became an assayer, an engineer, everything. And of course, uh, Richard followed on. By that time, they'd all moved back to Camborne again and were living in Pemponds at um, Trevithick's Cottage there, which you um, can go and see now, and by the Trevithick Society. Um, uh, Richard sort of very quickly developed as an engineer. Um, when he, by the time he was 16, he was working with the top local engineer, a man called John Budge, um, uh, who was a highly respected uh, steam engineer. And by the time he was um, finished his teenage, teenage li life, he, um, he was already a well-known engineer. People were beginning to respect him, his views and what he was able to do. And uh, very shortly after that, he, um, he was uh, involved in, in shares in mines as an adventurer as well as an engineer and of course the rest is history he then developed and 
went all over the, went all over South America and so on, invented the high steam um, pressure engine and oh, a whole load of modifications. Um, worked on things like um, drilling rigs for under for um, uh, working under the water and even was involved in a, in a tunnel under the Thames. He, he involved, was involved in a tremendous amount of different things. He was an extremely clever, innovative scientist in a way, but an engineer more than a scientist. So the family, really, that's the story of the family. And the house itself, as I've said, it uh, had a history that's shown on, on the plans and the records way back into the um, 17th, the, um, yeah, the 17th century, or the 18th century, I should say, the 1700s. Um, the written records of the family there start in 1767, when it talks about his dad renting part of the property, Penelic Bean, um, a property that was built by his father, by um, Richard's grandfather. So that really is, is basically the story of, of uh, Richard's early life and um, also his family background. Yeah, indeed. And uh, there's a marker just up the road in Poole, actually, yes, isn't yeah. there? Is, is that close by or is that actually in the right place? It's, well, the, the memorial actually says on this spot, but in fact it isn't. The, the house behind it is, is the house he was born in because that was Penelope Bean Farmhouse. And that's where the Terrific family lived. John, his son John, his son Richard, and then grandson Richard Terrific, the famous engineer. So, yes, it's the house that is still there, number 35. Jack Trounson, um, uh, quite a famous Cornishman, actually was the one who pointed the photograph out to me, oh gosh, 60 years ago and told me that in fact it was the house of Richard Trevithick and when we compared the photograph with the house uh, we, then you could see much more clearly because none of the houses the newer houses were built so you could approach it and see it much more clearly you could see that it was the same the same house can you show us the house yes certainly you, there, you are. there it is and um this is upside down this I is this is thought it was thatch. Yeah. It isn't thatch now, of course. No. But when you look at the front of the house, um, especially when you can stand back from it, you can see that it, it is the, the same, the same building. And uh, as I say, it was there in 1880. It was there in 19, in 18, in the 1880s, 90s, the Ordnance Survey maps. It's still there in 1906, and it's still there now. It's the same place. And it's shown, as I say, if you look at all the maps, right way down from the 1750s, the series of maps and plans. The building is the same, in the same position, the same footprint, right the way down through. So there's no doubt that that was the house that uh, Richard was born in. We went along to Fowler to meet the Lord Lieutenant of Cornwall, Edward Belitho, who was laying a wreath to remember those lost in the St Nizir raid. Afterwards we caught up with him to hear his message. Richard Trevithick takes us back to a different Cornwall, to a place at the centre of the Industrial Revolution, to a prosperous industrial Cornwall providing minerals and the highest of technology all around the world. He was at the spearhead of Cornwall's efforts, this one man, inventing the first steam engine and the first steam train, which both were absolutely vital components of industrialisation in the world. And funny enough, he came to Thor in Ding Dong Mine, where he was working for a long period, which is only about a mile from where I live, and which my family was involved in for very many years. Sadly, like so many brilliant inventors, Richard Trevithick died in poverty, but his legacy is still with us. And as Cornwall again seeks to lead the world in technology and in mineral production, it is really good to remember this man, especially through the annual Trevithick Day. Well done to Camborne for celebrating every year with the puffing devil, with all the dancing and all the parades. And I'm only sorry that once again it's had to be put off this year. But next year, let's go for a really big revival of this wonderful event that remembers a man who is an absolutely key part of Cornwall's history and a key part of the world. Next, Colin French from the Dravithic Society is going to tell us a bit about steam engines including Trevithick's Puffing Devil replica, which was built by the Trevithick Society and made its first appearance in 2001. 
Richard Trevithick was born in one of the most industrialised places in Britain, surrounded by the uh, tin and copper mines, uh, which were reliant on low pressure steam engines um, from Thomas Newcomen to drain them, and later on those of James Watt. These engines were known as atmospheric engines um, because they relied on um, the, the weight of atmospheric pressure bearing down on the piston to move the, uh, the pump rod up and down and so operate the pumps in the mine. I've, just to illustrate how it worked, I've created this rather crude model. But if you can imagine, there was a massive engine house and inside it you've got a, a large cylinder and a large piston and connected to the piston is a beam which is actually held on the outer wall of the engine house and at the far end of the beam there's a pump rod which descends to the bottom of the shaft and um, to the pump which is at the very bottom of the mine. And then outside the engine house you have a separate building with a fire and a, um, a boiler which was like a giant kettle and the engine also needed a reservoir to keep the water um, to supply the engine and the way it worked the steam from the boiler would be fed into the cylinder filling the cylinder you then pour in some cold water which creates a vacuum inside and then the weight of the atmosphere bears down on the piston pushing the beam down and so activating the pump at the base of the mine. This would then be drained and it would just rise again to its equilibrium point and then you start again pumping steam. So it was a slow laborious process, very inefficient, but it was the best system available at the time for pumping mines. These low pressure engines were uh, well, when, when he was a boy, in fact, it's quite amazing to think that half of the steam engines in the world were located in Cornwall. And the reason for this was that the, these engines were of very little use except to pump water, and that's what the Cornish mines needed. Um, but they were also very expensive to make and operate. Um, and they, they also needed a, a substantial engine house, separate building for the, the um, boiler and, and the reservoir and so on. So they were all very expensive um, capital needed to house one of these engines. As he, as he grew up and um, proved himself to be a, um, an inventive uh, person, he was employed at quite a young age as a consultant engineer at local mines and this was a time when the mine owners were actively looking to improve the, uh, the, the low pressure steam engines and um, help make them run more cheaply. Um, there were several reasons for this. One was that the Cornwall doesn't have any coal, commercial coal of its own so that had to be imported from South Wales which is quite an expensive thing. Uh, the, for the last 25 years of the 18th century, James Watt had a virtual monopoly on uh, the manufacture of steam engines and the Cornish mine owners were very resentful about paying high, huge sums of money to James Watt to use his engines. So various local engineers, including Trevithick, experimented a great deal in um, producing, in, well, developing improvements to the low pressure steam engine, and it was Trevithick who came up with the answer. This was not only a great benefit to, to local mines, but proved to be an engine which changed the entire world, and that was the, his invention of the high pressure steam engine. Well, this is a model of Trevithick's very first locomotive, which was known as the Puffing Devil. His very first high-pressure steam engine was installed at Dulcoth Mine in Camborne, and 
was essentially the same as this, but it didn't have the wheels. It was a stationary engine. But right from the outset, he realized that the end, his high pressure steam engine was powerful enough to move itself. And he went on to, within a year really, to develop this engine, the Puffin Devil, to prove that a high pressure steam engine could drive on the road. It was radically different to the previous low pressure atmospheric engines. Um, and basically you've got a cylinder which is inherently very strong and inside it's one of his great innovations to, was to put the fire inside the boiler. Um, the, the fire actually goes to the end of the boiler, does a U-turn and then comes out as a chimney. The piston is housed within the, the cylinder block and with the old high pressure steam engines you had a massive piston which was, could be three or four feet across. In, in this case it was much much smaller and he recessed it into the boiler which is more thermally efficient. Um, he completely dispensed with the, the use of atmospheric pressure and in this case it's the high pressure steam which pushes the piston up and also pushes it back down again which is much faster and more efficient and more powerful. The exhaust steam was sent out through a tube and up the chimney and that draws air through the fire creating a much better fire so again makes it more efficient. But because it's a high pressure steam with the old engines um, if you needed to put water in the boiler you just lift the lid like you would a normal kettle and pour cold water in but you can't on this one so he has a, a tank for the water but he's got a separate pump which pressurizes that water before it pumps it into the boiler so there's a lot of innovation and a lot of different changes to anything that was previously known This um, engine, the significance really is it was the high pressure steam engine that went on to power the Industrial Revolution for the next hundred years, both on the road, the rail, at sea and in factories. In the case of factories, this was such an adaptable engine um, that factories could be sighted virtually anywhere in the world. They no longer needed to be tied to a water wheel or sighted on a coal field. So that is a tremendous change that happened. But probably the most important thing was the development of the railway. And uh, in 1804, he demonstrated the first railway locomotive in South Wales. But if you think of the way that the, the railways spread right across the world, across continents. Um, it dramatically changed the, the whole of the world. So this engine, it all started here with this engine, but it had a, over uh, 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 incredible significance, incredible um, magnitude of change that was caused throughout the entire world. Um, This engine effectively was um, much smaller, more compact, more efficient, um, more powerful than the previous engines. It was cheaper to manufacture and um, it was much more adaptable. So there were so many different uses that could be made of it. It's, it's quite amazing to think that all these changes that happened in the next hundred years began here in Camborne with the Puffing Devil effectively um, and if you th think that on Christmas Eve when Richard Trevithick in 1801 drove up Camborne Hill that was really a pivotal moment in the development of the modern world. Well the original engine cost Trevithick £70 to make and it took him about 14 months to build it in um, a blacksmith shop on Wilgarry Mine in Camborne. It took us about six years to make the replica and over a hundred thousand pound 
Um, but actually much of the money was paid in kind because a lot of local companies made parts for it. It was made at Holman's in Camborne um, and Holman's had long believed, because that firm started in 1801, they've long believed that they might made parts for the original engine. So it was amazing to think 200 years later that they were making parts for the, for the replica. How old is the replica now? Well, we made it for its 200th anniversary, which was in 2001. And we ran it on its original route through the streets of Camborne on Christmas Eve 18, uh, 2001, 200 years to the day. There was tens of thousands of people watching us going up the street. And it was an amazing experience. Um, and we, we proved what in, how amazing that his engine was to think that you know we, we made our engine as, as accurate as we could to the original um, specification we used many of the same techniques we had um, blacksmiths making parts for it um, all the bolts were made especially um, with square heads, heads as they were uh, in 1801 um, so we tried to make our replica as accurate as possible to the original and then to be able to run it 200 years up the same streets is totally amazing. What's it like to drive? We're used to it now. The steering is what most people comment about because it's, um, it's, a, it's a tiller which you move from side to side and if you hit a bump then it sort of telescopes. So it looks as if it's very um, awkward to use but actually when you're driving it it's very light and um, when we we've got we have modern brakes on it so if we need to brake it stops on a sixpence but there's actually three different types of brakes on it um, but have, having driven it around for 20 years we, we know our way around it and how to how to safely drive it through the streets now how long does it take you to get it ready to drive it can't, at the fastest is about three quarters of an hour to get enough steam up. But on some of the Trevithic days, it's so cold in the morning that um, we've taken about three hours sometimes to get sufficient steam to get it. And we've, we've arrived on station in, in the town of somewhat late because the, it's been so cold to get enough pressure up. Does it eat a lot of coal? When we're driving it, it does. Uh, we, I think one Trevithic day we used 11 bags of coal um, I th I, I, on our, if you're just using it as a stationary engine just turning it without moving then it's um, you could probably get away with 3 or 4 bags of coal for a day so depends what you're doing really We went along to County Hall to meet the Chief Executive of Cornwall Council Kate Canale. What do you think Trevithick Day brings to Cornwall? Oh, well, it's a great day, isn't it? It's a kind of um, in the heart of our World Heritage Site, which is a fantastic asset for Cornwall, celebrating our tin mining heritage. Um, and, you know, Richard Trevithick, um, what he brings in terms of Cornwall having been at the forefront of uh, new technologies being celebrated in Campbell, bringing communities together, celebrating our heritage, but showing kind of um, that we're a really, really strong community in Cornwall and we've got things that we're proud of um, and lots to celebrate about, about what we've got to offer uh, the world. Thank you. Um, right, obviously we're all looking forward to Dravithic Day in 2022. What would you like to see from the next event? Well, I just, I would really like to see it getting bigger. Um, you know, there's been some fantastic work being done in Camborne um, over over the last sort of 12 months with the Camborne Town Deal. Um, you know, really putting Camborne on the map, getting more people from across Cornwall coming together uh, to celebrate Richard Trevithick. Um, do you have any fond memories yourself of Trevithick Day that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I do actually. Um, so a few years ago, we had the uh, Cornish Embassy uh, bust come uh, be part of Trevithick Day and getting my uh, 
Cornish passport and uh, answering the questions correctly, which I was uh, mightily relieved about. But then standing on 4th Street and we're standing opposite the Red River Singers who were singing Camborne Hill with the steam engines uh, going up, it was, it was pretty special. And finally, do you have any messages for the organisers that do a wonderful job every year and get very little recognition? Yeah, so absolutely. On behalf of Cornwall Council, I just want to say a really, really big thank you. Um, I think this is one of the things that makes Cornwall such a great place uh, to live and be a part of are all these unsung heroes that put on these fantastic uh, community events. Uh, your walk doesn't go unnoticed, um, but for all of you that are um, you know, pleased to be a part of Trevithic Day, you enjoy it, then you know, I know you're always looking for more volunteers. Get involved, be a part of it so that we can continue to see a really vibrant Trevithic Day in Campbell. Ben Sumter from Cornwall Underground Adventures is a local Cornish historian. Richard Trevithick's legacy transcends our mere locality of Cornwall alone. Indeed, by celebrating this day, we recognise Cornwall's unique and focal role in the Industrial Revolution, a true end of an epoch, beginning with the Roman Empire and ending with the birth of steam. Trevithick's world was a changing one, and his pioneering improvements to the Bolton and Watt design put Cornwall centre stage on the world map in a way it had never been before. And what's perhaps even more interesting about this story is that Trevithick's world indeed has many parallels with our own today. West Cornwall is still known for its high number of small businesses and innovative new startups, and it would seem as though the zeitgeist of the Cornish entrepreneur in our own time would be something infinitely familiar to Trevithick over 200 years since demonstrating his great inventions that would lead the Western world. It is perhaps a legacy that is easy to overlook, but undoubtedly this living epitaph of a true Cornish worthy forms a part of all of us that spoke of Cornwall today. Rose Hitchens Todd is the engagement officer at Camborne Town Council. The government have uh, outlined a plan for 101 towns in the country to receive um, funding for up to £25 million. Camborne is one of four towns in Cornwall that have been outlined for this, this money. Um, we have submitted recently a bid um, for up to £25 million um, to invest in capital investments for Camborne, um, creating spaces and opportunities for the people of Camborne um, that are much needed and well deserved. Um, so we're waiting to hear back now from government we hope to hear before May um, in terms of uh, whether we've been successful in, in the plans that we propose. There's nine projects to go forward. Um, of those nine projects, um, all of them are focused on providing community or employment and skills um, sort of assets for Camborne. So. Will this benefit Terrific Day in the future? Uh, I think ter Terrific Day is absolutely essential to Camborne's um, sort of opportunities in celebrating Camborne culture. Um, and there will be benefit because we're creating spaces um, for the activities that happen for the festival to happen in. So yes, there will be improvements in the town centre and in our green spaces um, more widely um, and the festival will um, obviously be able to occupy those spaces in future and make use of those. Excellent. Um, what about um, Trevithy Day yourself? Do you go? Do you oh, like absolutely. it? Absolutely. It's a staple for anyone that lives in Camborne. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity. It's, it's one of the only occasions where everyone in Camborne comes out um, and really sort of celebrates um, the town and celebrates each other's successes. Um, it's a really lovely day for the family. Um, my children absolutely love it. Um, the steam um, parade is particularly um, important to them. Throwing coins under the rollers is a, is a Camborne tradition. Um, and uh, yes, we, we absolutely love it as a family. And hoping that it'll be back next year bigger and brighter. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think um, you know, we've really, really missed the opportunity to get together and to have the festival come back again, uh, bigger, brighter, and that opportunity for everyone to get together and enjoy themselves collectively is going to be really important to our community. Mark Thomas is the current High Sheriff of Cornwall. Good afternoon, I'm Mark Thomas. I'm the newly appointed High Sheriff of Cornwall. I'm uh, really a farmer and uh, a landowner here in North Cornwall, but I am really proud today to just be able to take a small part in the production of this video as we celebrate the 250th anniversary of the birth of Richard Trevithick. 
and uh, as others I'm sure have been more eloquent than me in uh, providing you with information uh, about Dravidic and he is one of our most celebrated inventors and uh, people from Cornwall. Um, it's just the fact that uh, he, he had so much to offer and gave so much to not just Cornwall but to Great Britain generally and to the rest of the world. And being in farming, um, obviously steam has played a huge part in the advancement of agriculture over the years. And one of Trevithick's great inventions was the steam threshing uh, machine. And uh, I believe this was used on the estate at Trewithan for many, many years. And uh, obviously we, we know about Richard Trevithick and his uh, steam carriage and uh, locomotives but uh, it's only recently that I've learnt about uh, his uh, involvement in the threshing machine. And so that, that's uh, exciting, but also it's what uh, Trevithick did for the rest of the world. He, he travelled abroad, he, he brought uh, the steam power to the silver mines, and uh, I suppose much of his life was dedicated to making life easier for uh, people in their everyday working life and uh, that is something to, to really celebrate. And so it's disappointing that uh, we're not able to celebrate Trevithick's um, birth, uh, this anniversary of his birth in person, but um, if we just recap over some of the wonderful times of the Trevithick day, I guess one of the, the, the most important things is that this day has instilled a sense of pride and um, the fact that we're uh, we're very proud people perhaps of our Cornish heritage but uh, part of that has been the fact that uh, there have never ever been any serious uh, public order incidents at Trevithick Day and that's something we can be very proud of and uh, obviously originally it was policed by uh, the Devon and Cornwall Police but more recently by uh, a security company and so in my position as High Sheriff and very much involved in law and order and the upholding of the law here in Cornwall, I'm very proud of, of that uh, record that uh, the people of Camborne have celebrated this day and, uh, and not made it um, an excuse to just uh, have a good fight or whatever. So I do congratulate you on that. And uh, we look forward now to many more Trevithick days and celebrating this wonderful man's birth and uh, celebrating his wonderful inventions and all that he brought to mankind here uh, and throughout the whole world. Thank you. And finally, here is something really special. A message from the Peruvian ambassador. My name is Juan Carlos Gamarra, Ambassador of Peru to the United Kingdom, and I'm delighted to take this opportunity to send Camborne a heartfelt message on the 250th anniversary celebration of its most famous son, Richard Trevithick. In the words of Estuardo Núñez, a very famous Peruvian historian, Richard Trevithick was a true friend of Peru. I would like to echo those sentiments. Trevithick is considered one of the fathers of the railroads and came to Peru with one of his inventions, the high-pressure steam engine, to help the works in the Cerro de Pascua mines, as well as contributing to the manufacture of national coins. It is relevant that he was in Peru in 1821, the year when we became an independent nation. So we especially remember him this year in which we celebrate our bicentennial. I convey warm greetings to all citizens of Camborne, I have a long delayed visit to Cornwall on my bucket list, so I hope to visit you as soon as conditions allow it. Likewise, I would also encourage you to retrace Trevithick's footsteps in Peru, where you will always be welcome. Thank you very much.
We hope you have enjoyed these messages from the people of Cornwall and we look forward to seeing you at the next Trophithic Day, hopefully next year. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. I've stood on Cape Cornwall In the sun's evening glow On June hill at New Lynn To watch the fishing fleets go Watch the sheave wheels at Giver As they spun around and heard the men singing as they go underground and no one will ever move me from this land until the Lord calls me to sit at his hand for this is my Eden, and I'm not alone. For this is my Cornwall, and this is my home. I've left childish footsteps in the soft sun and sand. And I've chased the maids there Oh, giggly and tanned I've stood on the cliff top In a westerly blow And I watched the waves thunder On the rocks far below and no one will ever put me from this land Until the Lord calls me to sit at his hand For this is my Eden and I'm not alone for this is my Cornwall And this is my home First thing in the morning On Chapel Park Road And gaze at the sillies In the blue far away for this is my Cornwall And I'll tell you why Because I was born here And here I shall die And no one will live Until the Lord calls me to sit at his hand For this is my God and I'm not alone For this is my call and this is my hope for this is my Cornwall, and this is my home.